Greetings and welcome to Calvary Chapel of Leesburg, Florida, to the Wednesday night Bible study in the book of Proverbs. Tonight we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 6, and we will be in verses 20 through 25. My name is Ron Stauffer. I'm the pastor at Calvary Chapel, and we begin this meeting on Wednesday night with this teaching online. It shows up first typically on our Facebook page, which is Calvary Chapel of Leesburg. And that gives you, I try to get that posted by Tuesday night so that you have a chance to chew on it, go back to your Bibles, do a little bit of research, come up with some good questions and points for discussion. And uh, it gives you a bit of a head start on our discussion time. Then we have at 7 p.m. Wednesday night, we have our discussion time. So. This meeting is for August 12th, the year of our Lord, 2020. We will be in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 through 35. The title is Character Flaws, Part 3. <clears throat> Excuse me, Adultery and Theft. Adultery and Theft. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for bringing us together on uh, through this electronic media. And we ask you, God, to give us this, uh, in this word today, in Proverbs chapter 6, we ask you to give us something new that we haven't perhaps seen before, a greater measure of understanding. Lord, the book of Proverbs, you said at the very beginning in chapter 1, is about justice, judgment, and equity, so that we could know justice, judgment, and equity. And we ask you, God, to help us to understand justice, judgment, and equity even better because of our study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, you want to take out your Bibles and turn with us to Proverbs chapter 6. And so, Wednesday night meetings are a little more free-flowing than Sunday morning, a little, uh, quite a bit less formal, and we really encourage discussion <clears throat> after I bring a message. And so we encourage you to go ahead and write down your questions, but also your comments and your points of discussion. And maybe maybe even you hear something from me that you have a different perspective on than me. I would love to hear it. I think we would all love to hear it in our meeting. Also, if you are with us tonight on the Facebook live stream and you would like to be a part of our Wednesday night discussion on Zoom, and perhaps you just haven't, haven't even visited our church before, you can give me a call. My number is on the Facebook page, and it's on our church website at ccleesburg.org. Uh, you can also type in ccleesburg.com, and it will come up as well. So uh, just give me a holler and I'll see what I can do to get you on there. Uh, typically, we like to just sort of control that a little bit so it's a safe environment, but uh, you, you could be welcome to that. I might want to meet with you first. We'll see, we'll see um, what the situation is. So just give us a holler if you want to join us. Uh, I'm also aware that perhaps some of my old friends uh, from other aspects of my life may be joining us from time to time. Uh, on Facebook, and, and perhaps you'd want to join in a discussion as, as our guest. So you're welcome to contact me, and we'll do that. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 20 through 35. And you're going to see uh, in the middle of there two verses that seem to not quite maybe fit like into the whole context of all the other verses. It's, I assure you, it's just an illusion. They do actually fit, but they can also stand independent and alone. And I'll let you figure out which two verses that is as I read. Proverbs 6, verse 20. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Again, this is a father and mother talking to their son. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Re 
Reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. Whoever commits adultery with the woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give him many gifts. Lord, thank you for this reading of your word. I ask you, God, to bring it real to our hearts. Maybe show us something tonight that we didn't see before and that we could actually use as a practical matter in our comings and goings with other people and in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you catch that section that might appear to be somewhat um, standing alone? Maybe that doesn't quite seem to be to where it fits right in there. If, if you were saying, if you were thinking verses 30 and 31, that's what I was thinking as well. We have this long section about do not commit adultery and uh, which is a, which is a, on the theme of the seventh commandment in Exodus. And it says here, people do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. When he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. So I wonder what that is doing right in the middle of our text about adultery. Let's keep that in mind. So to review, this entire chapter um, is pretty well divided by those who assigned chapter and verse to the scriptures in, uh, in the 1500s. Verses 1 through 5 speak about rash vows that can trap you. Verses 6 through 11 speak about laziness and the failure to plan ahead that can impoverish you. Again, these are all deep character flaws. Verses 12 through 19 speak about lying, scheming, and cheating that can ruin you. Verses 20 through 35 speak about adultery, which can get you killed, is the idea. And verses 30 through 31, that little subsection inside our text tonight, speak about taking another man's earnings. Taking another man's earnings, and we'll kind of unlock that sort of mystery sort of question tonight. Let's dive into it, shall we? We're going to go through the uh, adultery section fairly quickly because we've been on that uh, in a couple of chapters before. My son, verse 20, my son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. So again, we have uh, a reminder that the Probably the entire book of Proverbs, really, or at least this section of Proverbs, these several chapters, are the form, take the form of an address from a father and a mother to their son, and also to their children, which could be sons and daughters, because it does go back and forth from saying, my son, remember this, or my children, we want you to remember this or to take heed of that. Keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Now, here we see the, the words command and law 
And we're going to see, and, and it's referred to as the Father's command and the Mother's law. But in just a few verses, we're going to see that it's God's command and God's law. Bind them, verse 21, bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. And we've seen this idea before. Uh, we'll see it again, I believe, in uh, Proverbs chapter 7 about uh, keep my commandments and live and bind these things on your fingers, write them on the tablets of your heart, say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend. I believe that's Proverbs 7. Yes. Proverbs 7 says, my son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. So there's a lot of chapters here that keep going over this theme of stay away from the seductress, stay, stay away from the immoral woman. Now, there are teachers who will teach that this is always referring to idolatry, that the seductress, that the immoral woman, that adultery, whenever you see the word adultery in Scripture, it always means idolatry. Well, clearly it does not. These are parents uh, speaking very explicitly to their son to stay away from an immoral woman and talking about her eyelids and, and uh, you know, that she's batting her eyes at you and she spices up her bed with, with spices and cinnamon and aloes and wears her most seductive clothing and so on. It's, it's obviously a picture of an actual woman actually trying to seduce a young man to uh, adultery. And the, there are cases where we could read that as uh, applying in principle also to idolatry. And there are certainly instances in the scripture where adultery is used as a metaphor for idolatry. But we start to get into trouble when we say adultery always means idolatry, or this always means idolatry. There are even people who say that whenever God speaks judge, with judgment about homosexuality, he's not, he doesn't really mean to judge homosexuality. What he means to judge is the idolatry which with which homosexuality was often uh, associated. Uh, we get into trouble when we make those connections as a permanent, irrevocable thing. My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart and tie them around your neck. The idea is this is, this is something you're never separated from. You've got this amulet around your neck. You've got God's law continually upon your heart. So when you roam, they will lead you. That is, the commands and the laws will lead you. And when you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. That's a nice picture of peace, isn't it? That when you fall asleep at night, and if some of the last thoughts that you had from these laws and commands that were bound around your neck and written on the tablets of your heart, um, that uh, if you go to sleep with that on your mind, then it will, it will uh, keep you when you sleep. I don't know if that means you're going to have not bad dreams or you have pleasant dreams or you'll have uh, visions or something. But certainly, it makes more sense to go to sleep thinking godly things than it does to go to sleep thinking about the things of temptation about the lusts of the flesh. When you roam, they will lead you. So when you go to a strange place, when you go away from your home, you go away from where things are familiar, uh, these commands and these laws will keep you. When is it that we're really often more vulnerable? When we step out of our normal routine. Uh, sometimes, for example, traveling business people get into trouble when they go on the road. Why? because they don't have the normal accountability of going home from the office at night. And uh, instead they're staying in a hotel in a strange city and there's nobody there to be accountable to. And hey, you know, I'll just watch this program on TV or I'll go to this movie or I'll go down to the bar in the hotel and have a drink and strike up a conversation with who knows whom. 
Um, there's danger in that. There's a, a lack of safety there. So uh, when you roam, they will keep you. The commands and laws will keep you. When you sleep, they will, uh, when you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak to you. So just picture it this way. Maybe you're a business person on, a, on travels and you are continually meditating on God's commands and laws and even those teachings of your parents or your pastor or uh, somebody that you watch online who is a really excellent Bible teacher and a moral teacher. And you think about those things as you go from business and you go out to dinner alone and uh, you have these things on your thoughts. You're less likely to fall into temptation there. Then you go to your hotel room and uh, you think, you know, shall I turn on the TV and just mindlessly go through those 214 channels or whatever it is? You can tell I don't watch television on TV. Um, in fact, I virtually never, when I go to a hotel, I never turn on the TV. They might as well just take it out of the room. Um, it will keep you then. And then picture yourself falling asleep with, with God's law written on your heart and in, in the front of your thoughts. Uh, you'll sleep the sleep of the just. And then when you wake up in the morning, you know that that last thought that you went to bed with last night was, Oh, how I love thy law, O Lord. It is my meditation all the day. Thy commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. And you thought that when you went to bed last night, and maybe you wake up with that uh, song in your heart in the morning as well. Anyway, it keeps you. It helps to inoculate your heart from sin. It helps to prepare your mind to resist sin. And what is it that we're always resisting? It's we're resisting sin. Verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Here we have two, two terms for light, which light, the, which light our path. And where do we need a light? We need a light in, in a dark place. So we can go with God's word in our heart and with uh, the commandments of wisdom and righteousness and the law of righteousness. Uh, they will guide us through a dark place. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Instruction almost always involves some kind of reproof or correction. Very seldom is instruction uh, not, not corrective. There are a few things where I suppose it's not corrective. If uh, I were to instruct you on the, uh, on the life habits of the, the three-toed, yellow-bellied tree frog. I don't know. I just made something up there. That's not a rebuke to you. That's not a correction to you. It just happens to be information to you. But the, but the law and God's commands are, are generally uh, the for, take the form of some kind of instruction or correction or reproof. And they keep you, verse 24, from the evil woman from the flattering tongue of a seductress. So here we see that this that the adulteress is not just an adulteress, she's evil. She's evil incarnate. She's evil in the flesh. The evil woman and from the flattering tongue of a seductress. That's the that's the tongue of the evil woman. Flattering. This is how many many especially men fall, but you know what? Women fall this way too with flattering words. Uh, I remember as a correctional officer and a chaplain in a prison in another state that when a, in, this was in a men's prison, that when a female, a new female officer came into the prison out of uh, the academy, it was a contest among the male inmates in that prison who can get to her first? Who can trip her up first? Who can seduce her? Oh, yes, she is a target in that prison, which is why it's really, uh, really potentially quite hazardous to have a female officer in an all-male prison. Although I've seen some female officers who were outstanding and had really developed rapport 
and a great way of dealing with the male inmates. But they all went through their paces first. They were all these female officers were tested severely and sternly first. And uh, very, very often, I'm sorry to say, much more often than, you, than what you might think, a lot of these females did get, did get compromised. I should be clear about that. It's less than half. It's, it's, uh, it should be, the number should be zero. But it's probably, in my experience there, it was probably at least in the double digits. And that's, that's way too much. We must walk continually in an attitude of basking in the light of God's commandments. So many Americans today are stumbling around blind because they don't have the light and lamp of God's laws and commands to guide them. And they don't believe that there is a light and a lamp to guide them. I didn't set my phone for uh, do not disturb, apparently. <laughs> so we're back. And uh, many, many, many Americans and people all around the world don't even believe that there is an absolute standard of law by which we must then live. And those people are called postmodernists. You see, the modernist way of thinking, the modernist worldview, has to do with the scientific method and analyzing data, analyzing situations in a scientific way, and applying the laws of logic, reason, and evidence to them, such that they can uh, then be reasoned through, and you can come to a conclusion about the truth. Yes, I said the truth. Modernists believe in truth. Postmodernists do not believe in absolute truth. They do not believe in an objective, definable truth. They believe that almost whatever you can come up with in your heart and wish that it were so and wish that it were true, it is true. I can have my truth and you can have your truth because we don't have God's law or a, a, a command, God's commandments as a lamp to our way and a light to our feet. These things are to keep you from the evil woman. Question. They basically are to keep you from evil. So I asked myself the question, why do people do evil things? Why do people do evil things? And many of you who know me and have heard, heard me speak before have already heard the answer to this. And it's, uh, it's a fairly straightforward answer. It's not a trick question. Why do people do evil things? You may have your own answer, and I'll give you a second to write it down before I offer mine. Okay, a second's up. I think that people do evil things because they want to do evil things. It's quite simple, isn't it? They want to. That's what they desire to do. Almost nobody does evil things, or people would be much less inclined to do evil things if they don't actually want to do that evil thing at that time. And so what is the, what is the way to keep from wanting to do evil things? It's to keep your mind off the lust of doing evil things. It's to keep your mind focused on doing good things. Keep your mind focused on the light of the law of God. I had another, had another question. What is the best way to be sure that you don't want to do evil things? I think we just kind of discussed that. And I had come up with four possible answers. Um, but the world doesn't really know this. What is the best way to be sure that you don't want to do evil things? I thought of four possibilities. A, to not have the opportunity to do evil. B, to have somebody stop you from doing evil. C, to have somebody punish you after you do evil, or D, to not want to do evil in the first place. The world runs away, runs more to one of the first three uh, ways to be sure to not want to do evil things. They, 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 they uh, downplay the word not want to do evil things, 
And they kind of redefine it as to not do evil things. And so we see in our society, the more that we, the more that we move away from God, then the more, the more that temptation steps in. When we, when we follow God, we don't want to do evil things. But as we move away from God, then our society tries to put other pl- measures in place to stop people from doing evil things. A, to not have the opportunity to do evil. So we basically stop people from having, uh, let's say, the right to free expression, free speech. There's a big movement in the country now among young university graduates specifically uh, to deny free speech to other people. So if I, the idea being this, if I can deny you, who I perceive to be evil, um, the right to speak your mind, then I can deny you the ability to do evil. And that is a huge movement today. Uh, B, to have somebody stop you from doing evil. Well, how do you have somebody stop you from doing evil? You set up a lot of draconian laws which stop people from moving about freely, from exercising their liberties freely, which prevent people from having the opportunity to live their lives as they choose to live their lives, according to the will of God, according to God's law. Because again, God's law in a secular society or in a society that has wandered away from God's law, uh, God's law is not an impediment to doing to doing evil then if uh, if you don't have God's law. So they set up a society that has boundaries and fences all over the place. Or C, to have serious consequences or punishment for doing evil. In other words, to build a police state, build a police state. Uh, That looks a lot like uh, basically there's chaos in the streets, but if you... uh, But if you get really, really, really out of hand, we will punish you. We see this going on in Portland, Oregon right now, in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I just was watching the uh, mayor of Portland get on the Internet, the same mayor who had permitted absolute anarchy and chaos in his streets, um, not just recently, but as long ago as about a year, I want to say a year ago, He actually permitted a a radical extremist group to move into his city and to start blocking traffic downtown and redirecting traffic where this group could come in and say, we're taking over these three city blocks. You're just going to have to find a different way to work. And they would actually direct traffic like a traffic cop. And the city police were ordered to stand down and not stop that, that leftist anarchist group. Uh, from from stopping traffic. And now he, he gets on the internet and he gives this address saying, now you've gone too far and now you're attempting to murder people by blocking them into a building and trying to set the building on fire. And that is attempted murder. Well, sir, yes, you're the one who set up the conditions for that by permitting this anarchy. Verse 25, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. So a man is reduced to a crust of bread, or a woman is reduced to a crust of bread. This is speaking about giving over your free will, your uh, virtue to somebody who just wants to use you. So in this case, a, 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 a harlot, uh, but not, which w- he was just speaking of a while ago as an adulteress or a seductress. Uh, so what does, this, what does this evil woman or man want the, want the other person for? They want them for their own selfish gain, their own selfish pleasure. In this case, a harlot, she just wants the, the man for his money so that she can buy the price of, get the price of a loaf of bread. So she looks on you, sir, as her ticket to get her next meal, her next loaf of bread. So you are reduced to a crust of bread in that case. She's using you. 
Verse 27, can a man take fire to his bosom? So now we have a couple of, of uh, rhetorical, they're kind of rhetorical questions. We can answer them though. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? The obvious answer here is no. You can't take fire into your garment, pour some coals down here, and then your clothes are not burned. Can, can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? Well, generally speaking, no. Uh, by the way, that whole walking on coals thing is just a uh, that, that, that you see done uh, by some new age people or maybe uh, gurus, Indian gurus and so on. That's something that um, just about anybody could master. It relies on the fact that you're preparing yourself and kind of fearing the fire and the bottoms of your feet sweat. So then when you walk across those hot coals, uh, it causes that sweat on those soles of your feet to actually to, uh, to kind of bubble and it creates a little protective layer on the soles of your feet. And you have to walk over that fire quickly and get out to the other side before all the sweat is gone. But be that as it may, can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? The idea is no. So, so is he, verse 29, who goes into his neighbor's wife, whoever touches her shall not be innocent. So this is the picture of somebody who says, hey, I can handle it. I can walk on hot coals, excuse me, and not be burned. I can take this fire into my bosom. It won't burn me. The scripture here is saying you're deceiving yourself. Why do you walk right up to the edge of temptation and then think that it's not going to consume you? Verse 30. Here's that little subsection we were talking about. We're going to deal with it briefly and then come back to it. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. So this section of two verses doesn't necessarily at first glance appear to be integral and organic to the rest of the 15 verses that we're looking at. Uh, most of the passage is about adultery in general. Uh, but, and, but the idea is this, that, that uh, the, the thief... When could we as reasonable people maybe want to give us somebody who who sins against us want to give them a pass and just say you know what i understand i get it don't worry about it uh, i'm going to forgive this and move on um in this case people don't despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he's starving so that could mean that could be the picture of a thief stealing either your food or your money so that he can buy food or your property so that he can sell it so that he can by food. Um, but the law says that when he's found, he's got to restore everything sevenfold. That's a pretty serious penalty, a pretty serious fine, a sevenfold fine. So if I steal from you one sheep, I have to restore seven sheep to you. Now, if I was starving in the first place and I, and I didn't have uh, even one sheep that I could eat, that I could slaughter and eat, um, why would I have seven that I could repay you with? So now here's the idea. If you can't afford to pay back sevenfold, you will be sold into slavery. That's what was done back then. And it wasn't slavery for the rest of your life, but it was slavery um, on a written contract for a certain number of years, um, a lot of times like six or seven years, um, that, for which you would actually receive some compensation at the end of that time so it wasn't slavery in the sense of the American African slavery thing, but it was like a, it was like a, it was a servitude contract. You sold yourself into slavery. You earned the money, and then you would have to go back and and pay, and pay your victim back. But uh, if if you do something, steal something that is even understandable, the idea here is there is still a certain judgment. There is still an, a judgment that will be rendered against you once you're found out that you have to pay back. There's a serious consequence to this. So if an undespised man or woman must still be punished, 
how much more then would the despised person be punished? So we go to our next verse. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. No, it's you don't have to pay back a sevenfold penalty. You have to pay back everything. Your soul will be required of you for for th for this kind of sin, this kind of serious sin. Okay, there's a bit of I won't say hyperbole, but um, there's some really broad brush stroke terminology here. This is not specifically a passage about salvation, but the idea is this: your soul, your psuche in the Greek. Your life, life and soul, the same word in the Greek. So in the Septuagint here, it reads soul or life, uh, may be required of you. By whom? By the person that you offended. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. So you don't just pay back seven loaves of bread for stealing a loaf of bread or seven sheep for stealing seven sheep. In fact, there is no recompense that this man will accept. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. So there were certain egregious sins in the Jewish world that, that the victim could pretty much determine the penalty for, up to the death penalty. Uh, for example, if I killed your family member, uh, you have a right to seek my blood as retribution. But I also have the opportunity, depending on the circumstances, I may also have the opportunity to offer you a fine, blood, uh, blood money. Uh, I'll pay you, if you don't insist on me being killed, I will pay you 100 pieces of silver. Uh, that happened back then. But this jealous husband, he's not interested in money. And there are some sins that we can commit where you, you just cannot find your way out of it. The consequences are so large, so terrible. Just a couple seconds of negligence, let's say taking that extra drink before you get into a car and drive away. And then you kill somebody on the road. It was 30 seconds of just stupidity, but your life is ruined now, like forever. And you've offended people that will never be uh, uh, assuaged. And maybe you get a very long prison sentence or maybe a life prison sentence, who knows? There are some sins that hurt so much that they simply cannot be smoothed over and you cannot make amends. So, that's the general nature of those sins. I want to come back to verses 30 and 31. This passage uh, fascinates me. When God uses, uh, uses analogies, uses metaphors in the scripture, when he uses illustrations, the, illust the, the lesson that God is teaching is only true if the illustration is also true. So it makes no sense for God to say, uh, when, if God was teaching us something about how hot hell can be, and he said something like, uh, hell is so hot that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's as hot as a snowstorm in Minneapolis in December. That makes, that's nonsense. It makes absolutely no sense. So hell is as hot as what? As eternal fire, as unquenchable fire, as maybe a volcano or something like that. That would be a metaphor that God would, could use, would use, because it is actually true. And therefore it makes sense to teach a larger truth from it. So here we have a, uh, an illustration. People do not despise a thief. We're going back to verse 30. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. The human tendency actually is, in real life, uh, look, if you stole something from me uh, and I perceive that you didn't do it because you hate me or because you want to ruin me, but you did it because you're starving. 
I understand that, and I don't necessarily hate you for doing that. I don't necessarily bear a, a lot of animosity towards you for doing that. I get it. But then verse 31 goes on, Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. So this part of the illustration is also true, that thievery, stealing, is... It's always wrong. It's always a sin. If you do it, even if you do it because you're starving, look, the penalty may be mitigated for you, but you still get, you're still going to have to pay something back. You still got to pay it back. And this is a pretty substantial penalty here. Seven, sevenfold is a pretty substantial penalty. Where I'm going with this is this. I think we've lost sight of this in today's, in our age today. We've lost sight of uh, the idea that, well, we've got this situation where people make excuses for the, for the crimes that they commit. They go before the judge and, well, judge, uh, yeah, I did rob that bank, but you need to understand that I, was, uh, I, lived, I was, grew up in a single parent home. And, when, and it was my mom who raised me and she never paid attention to me and Whenever my dad would show up, he was drunk and he would beat me and so on. Yeah, but sir, you stole $150,000 from a bank. I'm sorry for your upbringing, but you got to A, you got to pay that money back and B, there's going to be a penalty on top of that. I get it that you had a bad past, that you had some bad breaks, but uh, you got to pay that back. You're still going to have to you did the crime, you're still going to have to do the time. So you got to pay all that money back and you're going to be 10 years in prison or whatever the penalty is there. We've kind of lost sight of this and we actually have a movement uh, of thinking in our, in our nation and maybe in the larger part of the world as a whole that uh, I can do really bad things to you if I have a really good reason. Um, I just need a good reason. Now, who gets to decide what that reason is? We're coming to the point now, and you look around in your country now, and you see anarchy in the streets. You see without rule of law, W-R-O-L. It means without rule of law in the streets of many cities, or at least that the police are completely overwhelmed. A total lack of respect for authority. People are out committing crimes. They're burning down buildings. They're assaulting people. Uh, they're shooting people. And because they, because they say, but I have a really good reason. My reason is I'm really upset and angry about this injustice that happened over here. I'm very upset about that. Okay. I'm upset about it too. But you assaulted someone. Or, but you, you blew up fireworks so that they shot into a building and set the building on fire. Yeah, but, but judge, I'm really upset. I'm, I'm a social justice warrior. I'm trying to correct the ills of society. I'm here to make things right. Oh, you're going to make things right by burning down buildings and assaulting people. Yeah, but those people represent, and then all these excuses go on. Those people represent all the things that are wrong with our society and so on. The principle is this. If you do the crime, you do the time. And even if you can come up with an excuse that you can convince a lot of people of that, yeah, you know, I can understand your mindset and why you would be upset. And so I just, I guess I don't hate you because you burnt down the federal building or I don't hate you because you looted Macy's or Walmart. Uh, but a society cannot stand it cannot persist. It cannot survive if there is not a rule of law. If thieves, even just to feed themselves when they are starving, are allowed to steal whenever they, in their judgment, think that they have no other option but to steal, if they are then let off the hook and not made to pay back sevenfold, that society will crumble. It will die. It will cease to exist eventually. 
It will fall apart from within. It doesn't even need a foreign enemy to bring it down. So when he is found, he must restore, <coughs> excuse me, he must restore sevenfold. And he may have to give up all the substance of his house, everything. The consequences, according to God and God's law, and According to man and man's law, when man reveres God, when man fears God, or at least God's principles, the consequences must be exacted, or ultimately the barbarians at the gate will come in and take over. And right now, do we not perhaps even see barbarians at the gate? Think about that. Let's discuss that this evening. Um, I was reading my newspaper, the Epic Times. This is my issue from this week. And uh, there's a lot of good articles in here uh, about, about this. Uh, there's another thing. They have a section in here called Life and Tradition. Life and Tradition. It's about... It's not about the news, it's about things that affect our lives. I uh, hear they're talking about kicking stress, uh, about doing exercise, about teaching manners to the young. Here's a section on why socialism, let's look at this. Why socialism sounds like American values to so many. Can you see that? Why socialism looks like American values, sounds like American values, in quotes, to so many, to so many people. And there's a great article in here about that. <clears throat> and I'll just open it up and provide a little bit of food for thought for our discussion tonight. So here's a book by a fellow. It's a review of a book by a fellow named uh, uh, Lane Murray who wrote a book called The Socialist Temptation. The Socialist Temptation. And uh, just to read a little bit out of here. Support for socialism in America isn't new, nor is the successful push for socialist policies. It seems to reemerge every few decades but what's new this time, according to Lane Murray, <clears throat> is a much poorer understanding. That may be Ian Murray, I think it is. Is a much poorer understanding of what socialism actually is. At the moment, it's hard to pin down, said Murray, what they mean by socialism. He, is, uh, he directs the Center for Economic Freedom at the Competitive Enterprise Institute in Washington. By the way, I get a lot of publications from them, the Competitive Ent Enterprise Institute. <clears throat> if he asks, one might answer, an economy like Sweden's, except that Sweden ranks higher than the United States in the free market trade, in free market trade, has a competitive school choice model, like you get to choose where your kids go to school, and taxes and corporation and it taxes corporations at about the same rate as the United States. And he goes on and so on and so forth. And he speaks about the cycle of socialism. You know, uh, we want, we have all these needs in society. People have needs. People's needs aren't getting met, quote unquote. Uh, how shall we rectify that? I feel a moral responsibility to somebody who's less fortunate than me. Uh, how can I act on that uh, moral responsibility? <clears throat> and rather than personal private charity, Rather than forming uh, nonprofits and charities to help people to do to help people do better, uh, they want to have the government do it instead of themselves. And they figured that that's all okay as long as we vote on it and we charge people taxes to fund that. Well, there's a cycle that happens, and it's like this: people will call for these programs, and those programs will go along just fine for a year or two or maybe three. And then it all starts to crumble because 
people learn how to game the system. They learn how to figure out how to get something for nothing. Uh, we have a recent example of that in uh, the un unemployment benefits in our country. In the name of uh, helping people through unemployment, we've actually created more unemployment in the last couple of months. There are about, there is an estimate that about 90% of the people who are receiving that extra $600 per week federal unemployment payment on top of their state unemployment benefits if they lost their job to the coronavirus, about 90% of people are now earning more money on unemployment payments than they were before when they were working a full-time week. And I know for a fact, and I have talked to people who have told me about at their companies that people are finding ways to stay home and to not be brought back to work or to work uh, only a certain number of hours so that they can continue to get that $600 a week, um, which is about $50,000 a year. Kind of kind of crazy money. Uh, Let's see, 2,400 uh, a month, 24, you got like pushing on $30,000 in extra unemployment benefits. And you can, you can work part time and you can put it all together to where you work about half the hours and you get almost twice the money. So uh, it, the whole thing starts to crumble after a while. And uh, when we start to, uh, when we start to want to take from one person and give to another. So I look at verse 30. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. And I, and I see that as one of the forms that that takes here is that socialism sounds like American values to so many people. We don't despise ourselves when we take money from our neighbor so that we can give it to that person over there on whom we have compassion. He's starving, so I'm going to go to my next door neighbor, take the fruits of his labor and give it to the starving person by force, by force. We'll use the force of government and the force of police to accomplish this. Um, let's talk about that. That's a real issue. Um, it's my contention. And my belief, and I'd love for you to correct me if you think I'm wrong, that uh, these programs that we seem to be voting for, which produce a more socialistic government, are doing, uh, the, they're having the effect of stealing from people in the name of relieving their suffering. But it doesn't relieve their suffering. In fact, we have as much or more poverty than we did when we started all these programs. Let's talk about it tonight. We'll, we'll close in prayer now. Lord God, we thank you for uh, a look in this book of Proverbs, chapter 6, and ask you, God, to give us some wisdom into uh, this uh, idea of consequences for adultery, and not just adultery, but the idea that some sins are so egregious that they can't be compensated at all, that they cannot be uh, ameliorated at all. The damage is so great from them. And give us some wisdom as we look into and discuss uh, the needs of our nation, the needs of our society right now, which seems to be crumbling around us. And, the, and to look at this thought that perhaps this creeping socialism, this creeping idea of entitlement, that I'm entitled to my neighbors, the fruits of my neighbor's labor, uh, is somewhere at the heart of, of uh, much of this mentality. We'll talk about it in our discussion. We ask you guys to God to guide us in that discussion. In Jesus' name, amen.